Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here. The only part of the introduction that you miss, my darling, is that I'm a proud mother of eight children. And that is to say I'm the real general standing here. Eight children, one husband, several goats, some chickens, and other things. This is another great day the Lord has made, and I will surely rejoice and be glad in it. Your Excellencies, Mama Grassa Michelle, someone I admire and hope to be like when I grow older, the Minister of Sports, the Mayor of Cape Town, members of the government, religious leaders, members of the diplomatic community, students group, the media, women of South Africa, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, also the trustees of the Mandela Foundation. I'm honored to have been selected to speak at this very distinguished occasion. I don't take this tax lightly, and I remain grateful. I cherish my own freedom dearly, but I care even more for your freedom, quote unquote, Nelson Mandela. Growing up as a little girl in Liberia, my first recollection of peace and justice at a global level was on first Sundays at the St. Peter's Lutheran Church, where prayers were said every first Sunday for South Africa and for Nelson Mandela's release. Offerings were collected to send to the All Africa Council of Churches to aid for aid and relief of the South African people. In our church, we the children always wanted to keep our offering coins for soda, pop, and candy. It was in those moments that my mother would be watching my f all five of us girls to see if we drop our coins in the basket for South Africa. I had many questions in my young mind about the issues that were being prayed for. People were suffering. People were being suppressed. Freedoms were restricted. Life was hard. Students were violated. Young people were beaten. Women were mourning their young ones. We were mandated to pray for an end to the sufferings. As I reflect on those years in preparation for this talk, I realized that several gifts were given to us as young people during those times. These gifts came in, came in the form of values, the value of sacrifice, the value of compassion, the value of service, and the value of our collective humanity. This, in my opinion, also captures the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela. Today, we gather to remember the sacrifice that this great man made during his imprisonment. He had powerfully declared during his trial that he would gladly give up his freedom, give up his life for his ideals of a society based on equality, democracy, and freedom. He dedicated his life in service to Africa's independence and in his quest to reconcile and reunite South Africa, he showed deep compassion and understanding. Nelson Mandela provides us with an example of the ethic of something you South African use often Ubuntu, that we are all connected and even though we are all complicated and flawed human beings, each and every one of us has a role to play in building the legacies of our co collective humanity. What we must ask ourselves as Africans in general and South Africans in particular is, are these values of sacrifice, compassion, service, and our collective humanity still key features in our everyday existence? Can we all say these remain prominent in our politics, religious expression, social justice activism, educational systems and structures in our daily interactions. I've been asked to speak on the theme, the presence of Africa. 
I will use during this period Mandela, Mediba, because I still feel as an African child to call an older person by their name is disrespectful. Even though he's not here, but I'm a bit worried and feel uneasy. So I will use his name interchangeably and use Mediba in between there. In the course of this talk, I will use one bad word and I pray that the religious leaders and the elders in this room will forgive me, but I will use it. In the course of this lecture, I will probably step on a few political toes. I am not apologizing for that. <laughs> the term prison points to the restriction of movement, confinement, the denial of a variety of freedom, a form of punishment, it can be used as a tool of political repression. On our continent today, there are many prisons and many prisoners in the former sense of the world. Those who steal, rapists, drug addicts, murderers, and many of those individuals who go against the laws of our land. We put them away and often refer to them as social deviants and individuals whose intention are solely to destroy the peace and tranquility of our lands. By isolating those individuals who wish the society ill, the theory goes, our communities will be more functional and every individual will enjoy the provision of the basic human security needs. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Our continent is riddled with so many vices that you would think that the Sustainable Development Goal was designed and instituted only for Africa. We are blessed with wealth and natural resources and a youthful population, but has failed to use these to give us the necessary tools for a better life. In many countries on our continent, our natural resources are more cursed than a blessing. Our youthful population has been described as powder keg. And just in case my Liberian English has obstructed your understanding of what a powder keg is, the barrel of a gun that can, the, the barrel of gunpowder sitting in a corner that can be used or will eventually be used for our destruction. Corruption, mismanagement, and lack of vision is the hallmark of many of our institutions, communities, and nations, leaving the most vulnerable, especially the young people, dreaming to cross the ocean willingly, this time to be imprisoned and enslaved in other people's land. Our political system and democratic institutions are structured in a way that it turns the masses into asses, just in case you don't understand that. When they're running for political offices, they're in trucks and pickups, and everyone can see them, and they're speaking to you. At that time, you are the masses. When they win, the glass of their cars are tinted, and you can barely reach them. You've become the asses. Our political systems and structures on the continent has turned most of our politicians into emperors. Sadly, many of our current day emperors who claim to lead us as people lack a lot in leadership qualities. Let me break it down. Jeffrey Gentleman, an East Africa correspondent before of the New York Times, tried to do an analogy of Africa's leaders yesterday and today. In his analogy, he said, looking at the current day's leaders, they are more educated, more traveled, and more schooled. Unfortunately, in comparison with the leaders of the past, the leaders of the past had a vision for the continent. They had a presence. When those leaders of old would walk into this room, you would know a leader has arrived. Today, mm. <laughs> Where is the vision for our continent and our people? Where is the faith that African cultures and innovation offer the solution to our collective ills when properly invested in? Rather, 
too many in leadership saw Rosin's more content with prolonging their stay in power, filling their Swiss bank accounts with funds that could be used to educate, heal, feed, and train the vast majority of our population. Today, politics and government jobs and position has become the fastest way to gaining wealth on our continent. I submit, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that Africa's prison is the condition or current state of life of the vast majority of our people. Africa's prisons is the mindset of our people, a mindset that pits us against each other, seeing every other African as a person in your country to steal your wealth, homophobia, racism, and every other vice. Africa's prison is the insensitive attitude of our leaders. I call it stony hearts. How do you ride a $500,000 car when you have people who can barely find food to eat on your watch? Africa's presence is the hopelessness in the eyes of our young people due to the lack of opportunities. Africa's prison is the repeated rape, abuse, and marginalization of the women of the continent. Africa's prison is the rhetoric and war and the promises of wealth for our young people to take up arms and kill their own people all in the name of revolution. Africa's prison is the division of our communities on the basis of ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, just to name a few. Africa's prison is the poor health infrastructure that has been normalized to the point that maternal death and infant mortality is taken as an everyday order. Africa's prison is the millions of individuals who are graduates of universities but cannot afford one square meal a day. Africa's prison is the justice system that represents the needs of primarily the rich and famous. I can go on and on and on naming the prisons of Africa. Madiba was confined, his movement was restricted, but his physical prison cell was not reflected in the imprisonment of his mind or his spirit. Imprison his values for life and the betterment of the life of his people guided him. His principle stands to protect the collective humanity guided his and plans, which became more expansive and more clearly articulated. Whilst like a way he could write and dream of a rainbow nation, he came out and was able to speak peace and reconciliation. Being locked away did not take away his humanity. He did not come up bitter with machete to kill those who restricted his movement. He came out with the message of hope, the message of peace, the message of the greater good of all. Service, sacrifice, compassion, and our collective humanity. Can we say, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is the current state of our continent and our African nations, that we are fulfilling the visions and dreams that he spent 27 years in prison for? Can South Africans really say this is the situation that is unfolding? For us to truly honor the legacy of this great father of Africa, we, including myself, leaders of this continent, must make conscious effort to realign our individual and collective priorities so that it reflects the interests, needs, aspiration of every citizen on the continent. There must be a transformation in the mindset of political leadership in Africa. Hear me, politicians. Africa is not your plantation. Africa is not your farm. Our shared resources must be governed with integrity, with development in mind, and not to steal. 
We as leaders must work exceedingly to bring along a generation of young people who will step into our shoes and carry out the vision of an educated population, an empowered, recognized, and valued population of women. We must ensure that the natural resources benefit those communities that they are exploited from and not the other way around. The values I see in Madiba's life present a roadmap for peace and development if African leaders and citizens can adopt the ethics of sacrifice, compassion, service, and our collective humanity. We will be able to create the conditions necessary for each and every human being living in this space called Africa to have a dignified life. As a peace activist, who sometimes I'm referred to as a crazy woman, mad, whatever name you want to call it. I was in Diara Congo and having conversation with some people and one of the men said, you know we forgive you, Madam Bowie, and I said, why? He said, because your activists are like the mad people in the village who say anything to anyone and we can't imprison you, not in this current day. So as a peace activist, people often ask me what it means to live in peace. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my friends, fellow Africans, peace is not passive. Peace is not defined by the opposite of war. No, peace is love. Peace is justice. Peace is the existence of an environment where people thrive and have their needs met. It looks like a population of satisfied people, educated children, functional health system, responsive justice structured, recognized and appreciated and fully compensated community of women, food on the table for every home and a lot more. Peace is the full expression of human dignity. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, what is the essence of this day? What is the essence of this day to South Africans? What is the essence of this day to the Mandela family, to the Mandela Foundation? What is the essence of us gathered in this city hall today? Is it just to chant slogans that will make us feel good? Or is it to come and listen to activists like myself and do analysis later on about how the English clash with whatever Is it just to come and be well-dressed and show up and say I was part of the 30th anniversary celebration? If we're only celebrating his release from prison, we miss the mark. The opening of those prison doors was much more than a man walking out. It was about the rebirth of a nation the rebirth of a continent. It was about laying a path for generations unborn. It is about a continent taking control of her resources, her politics, and her history. Madiba's walk out of prison was to ensure Africa's release from the prison of our minds. We should no longer be held hostage to greed, poverty, and corruption. Rather, we should hold strong to the values of sacrifice, service, compassion, and our collective humanity. I thank you. <laughs>